Good morning. It works. <laughs> okay. Thanks, everybody, for uh, coming to our presentation. Um, I'm Geneva Henry, and we're going to talk about some work we've done um, in looking at the model of centers of excellence uh, for information services. And uh, in this uh, area, what we want to do is talk about this project that we've done, um, which was a planning grant, uh, and then how we went about doing it, the methodology, uh, looking at reasons that um, people and uh, both centers and funders have given for um, starting centers of excellence, um, how people react to the term center of excellence, uh, look at the business models that centers of excellence have established and what seems to work, what doesn't seem to work, and then talk about our next steps as a group and what we're doing on the grant. So first I'd like to introduce the team. Um, Jose Diaz, he's with the Ohio State University. Uh, Susan Fliss at Harvard University. Heather Gendron, uh, she's University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Myself, Geneva Henry, I'm at George Washington University. Uh, Joy Kirchner, University of Minnesota. And then we have uh, two team members who are uh, in absentia, but they're with us in spirit. And that is John Cawthorn, who is um, newly at uh, West Virginia University, uh, and John Culshaw, who's at the University of Iowa. Uh, so what is this project? Uh, how did this all happen? This was a grant-funded project. Um, and the thing that all of us have in common, we have a lot of things in common, <laughs> but where this got started, um, we were all part of the ARL Research Library Leadership Fellows Cohort. Um, and one of the things that we did uh, within that cohort was take a visit to the Mellon Foundation. Uh, Don Waters uh, and Helen Collier were gracious enough to invite us up and meet with us um, to start uh, brainstorming ideas around, you know, libraries for the 21st century and, you know, with this next group of leaders coming up, you know, what were we interested in? What kept us up at night? Um, you know, what things did we worry about and what did we really want to do? Um, so it was, it was actually a wonderful brainstorming se session about the future of library um, directions. And one of the topics that came, came up was the number of services libraries are now being called on to provide, uh, and it uh, uh, requires skill sets um, that are not being produced in our library schools. So um, certainly we are going outside of library schools to bring in the professionals that have this knowledge and expertise. Um, but when you try to scale that up to every uh, library, as every research library and even broader every library, um, to fully support the services that we're all being asked to support, um, it, you start to see it starts to break down. Um, it requires a lot of skills that uh, are rare at this point. Um, so we looked at uh, possibly exploring other ways of providing those services, um, and we uh, landed on this idea of uh, centers of excellence. Um, and would that model work for information services? Would that model work specifically for libraries to be looking to, rather than developing their own um, whole uh, set of skills in all of these areas, can we think more in terms of centers that provide these for multiple institutions? Um, so uh, Mellon did award us a planning grant uh, to explore this idea of centers of excellence for information services as shared expertise. The kinds of services we're talking about for the 21st century library include um, digital archiving and preservation, data management, um, use of multimedia in teaching, learning, and research, information discovery, search, um, scholarly communications and digital humanities. So what we were trying to do is assess the viability of this center model um, as an approach to provide the, the services for multiple institutions. Um, and then, you know, through our, our research, provide both funders and uh, future centers with some guidance um, about what are the kinds of things uh, you should be thinking about or looking for um, in a center of excellence? 
Uh, we started by developing, um, did a lot of exploration, a lot of research on centers that exist out there and ended up developing what we call profiles for um, 34 uh, centers that might sort of fit into this idea of a center of excellence. Um, and then from that we whittled it down to um, 19 centers that we uh, felt warranted uh, in-person or Skype interviews to dig more uh, deeply into how they operate, um, and then seven funders. So we uh, did interviews with this um, group of people to uh, arrive at our findings. So I'm going to uh, turn it over now to Heather Gendron, who will talk about the methodology that we used. Okay, so our high-level questions for this project um, looked at you know, how, effect, how are these effective and successful centers actually formed? What was their genesis story? Um, how do they operate on a day-to-day -day basis? And how are they sustained over time? Um, we were also interested, related especially to that sustainability issue, what were the criteria we can identify through these interviews for funding both um, the formation of a center and the long-term sustainability of a center. And of course, we were interested in understanding how these centers assess themselves internally and how um, they're required to um, do assessment. So as Geneva said, um, we conducted overall 26 interviews, and these were all recorded interviews and transcribed. And seven of the interviews were with these funding agencies that you see here on the slide. And then these are the centers. Um, and we did a lot of site visits. Most of these were site visits. Um, and we did, as a team, interviews with these 19 centers, with directors, for the most part, and other staff as well. And so these were hour-long interviews, typically. But sometimes it would go into maybe a two-hour time period. And we would get a little tour of the facility if we did a site visit. And these are our main questions. Um, and I just wanted to put them up on the slide, not so you'd have to read through them all right here, but these will be available to you um, on the CNI site. So we asked basically 10 to 12 main questions per interview, depending on the interview. Um, and there are a number of prompts that you don't see on the slide, so if you want more information from any of us just about this process, just let one of us know. So um, we asked center directors to give an overview of their center and its desired impacts to talk about the ways in which the center fosters and or instigates innovation or entrepreneurship. Um, we wanted to know what types of assessments they use to measure the performance and impact of the center. Our interviews explore the roles of partnerships and what successful partnerships look like to these center directors. And we spent a lot of time talking with them about their funding streams and what an ideal business model for a center might look like. We hope to develop this concept from these interviews of what a really, you know, a really good business model would look like for a center. And then finally, we talked about the center of excellence concept and what it meant to them individually, and if they considered their own center to fit this in, within this category. And so the questions we asked of funding agency program officers and directors really mirrored these questions we asked of center directors. And we were interested in seeing where their answers aligned with those of center directors and where there was some divergence. And so we asked funders additional questions about conditions for funding a center of excellence, factors that drive a successful center in their, you know, from what they've seen, and any perceived risk that they see in funding centers. So this is really today what we're reporting is our preliminary analysis. And this is what we've done to, to get to this point so far. We started off with individual team members um, looking at the transcripts from interviews that they took part in. And they started to, we started to harvest key quotes um, from those transcripts and then pull them all together in a shared document. And then as a group, we met in person and we did these rapid fire analysis sessions where we only allowed ourselves an hour <laughs> to go through the transcript uh, from each interview. Um, and we tried really hard to stick by that because um, we had a, quite a lot of work to do and many of us have become directors in the last year, <laughs> library directors, so we don't have a lot of time. Um, so then we identified um, patterns and best quotes and articulate, started to articulate sort of high level insights and reflective questions from these interviews. And so this is the process that 
that we're going to continue with, um, with the group. So I'm going to pass it on to Jose, who's going to start giving an um, overview of some of our findings. As uh, Heather indicated, we conducted a series of interviews with Centers of Excellence and funders. What I'd like to do is to give you a taste of the initial findings. These findings focus on two key issues. What prompted the creation of the centers and what are funders looking for when they are considering whether to fund a center of excellence or not. To put it more succinctly, what are the reasons, what reasons did people give to start a, or fund a center of excellence? This quote, I think, sums up the urges behind the creation of centers of excellence. It deals with the core of the academic enterprise, the creation of knowledge and its dissemination. That is truly the urge behind these centers of excellence. But all urges are not created equal. Some seem more aspirational and amorphous from the start. Others are more down to earth. I call the former the creative or initial, or initial impulse and I dubbed the latter reality check. There's nothing scientific or secret about these terms. I just made them up. Yeah, I just made them up. Uh, many centers of excellence we interviewed told us that they wanted to do the following things. They wanted to forge multidisciplinary approaches to address big issues. They wanted to build common infrastructures that will reach beyond one institution. They wanted to bridge disciplines to respond to significant cultural phenomena, to create a sanctuary for scholars, to offer scholars a place to go away from committee work, tenure and promotion, office politics. They also wanted to respond to specific questions and solicitations and to answer a particular proposal, a particular request for proposals. Notice some of these are very lofty reasons. They're good reasons, but they're short on specifics. The second section, I dub reality check. And here you can see more granular answers. They verbalize their desires a little better. In this set of answers, the COEs told us they wanted to understand the ethical role of technology. They wanted to understand the impact, the internet's impact on society. They wanted to transform scholarly publishing into open access. They wanted to enhance scholarship. They wanted to increase the flow and accessibility of e-science. They wanted to advocate nationally and internationally. And they wanted to reach a variety of audiences. When you combine the creative or initial impulses and the reality check, again, I made those terms up, you get a fuller picture. For example, centers of excellence want to respond to significant cultural phenomenon, such as the internet's impact on society or COEs wish to build common infrastructures to enhance scholarship and to make open access possible, among other things. At the end of the day, though, things, come into things came into focus and we all arrived at the same place. Centers of excellence are created because scholars and students want to forge, build, create, transform, enhance, increase, and more importantly, bring about change. One thing we are sure of, even at this early stage, is that if you don't have money, you can't create a center of excellence. <laughs> so what are funders looking for when they are trying to decide if a COE is worth their time and money? Well, funders are looking really for one thing, success. Why? Because funders see themselves as a venture capital operation. They are putting their money into what amounts to a startup company. Like good venture capitalists, they want to put their money in a place they think will be successful. As one funder put it, quote, you really got to prove the concept and show that there is demand for that center or that specialty, end of quote. So far, our analysis of the data shows that funders see the potential for success when they see the following attributes or a combination of these attributes. I won't cover all of them, but this is just a sample. Originality. A funder might fund an entity called a COE if the center is doing something nobody else is doing. They want to see a distinctive mission and distinctive goals. Passion and engagement. Leaders must exude passion. Trust between the PI and the granting agency is a key ingredient in this mix. 
impact beyond, beyond the confines of the institution. The NEH, for example, wants the lead institution to bring scholarly expertise, manage grants well, and bring in other good people from other institutions. They also want to see impact on scholarship. Common goals. Funders will fund initiatives that are in harmony with the funding agency's goals and strategies. Didactic potential. Can others learn, modify, and adapt not only the center's model, but its products? Leadership. As I mentioned earlier, there has to be trust between the funders and the PIs. Funders want to deal with leaders who have done their due diligence in preparation for the project, who understand the necessity of risk mitigation, and no less important, they need to see leadership that has the skills that build collaboration in groups that are different, libraries, archives, museums. As one funder put it, quote, Personal, personality counts because ultimately you have to trust the PI. Funders are also open to leaders who might not have all the expertise at the start of the project, but are sensitive to the important questions. Let me end where I started. What reasons did people give to start or fund a COE? The COEs want to push the boundaries of what's possible. They want to create new products, reach more people, enhance old technologies, and create new ones. Funders want to make sure that their investment doesn't go to waste, and that the centers they fund are viable, innovative, and sustainable, and that the leadership they entrusted with their money is trustworthy, competent, and visionary. I will turn this over to Susan now. During our meeting with the funders and the centers, we casually brought up the concept of center of excellence. And what was interesting was that many of the centers and some of the funders were put off by center of excellence. Um, they, they thought of it, they thought it was a little pretentious. And how do you become a center of excellence? And do you, do you just say that you're a center of excellence? They thought it discouraged innovation and collaboration. If someone claims they're a center of excellence, then does that discourage others from trying to research in that same area? And if you're a center of excellence, will others want to work with you because they may not feel that they have the expertise or the funding to be able to work with you on a certain level? One of, um, one of our interviewees actually quoted Jacques Derrida and said, there is no center at the center. And trying to be the center is the problem, rather than thinking about what your goals are or how you want to have impact. So we then read a definition of the centers of excellence. And we took the, the, a definition from Carnegie Mellon Software Engineering Institute. A center of excellence is a premier organization providing an exceptional product or service in an assigned sphere of expertise and within a specific field of technology, business, or government, consistent with the unique requirements and capabilities of the COE organization. We had to read it a couple times so that they could absorb it. Um, and interestingly, once we shared this definition, they started to identify with parts of it, uh, especially exceptional product or service and assigned sphere of, of uh, excuse me, assigned sphere of excellence. Um, we asked them how broadly or narrowly they believed a sensor of excellence should be defined and if they thought they were one. Overall, humanity centers and funders were less comfortable with the concept of centers of excellence, uh, but the science and engineering centers and funders seemed to understand it better, and, and um, some of them did reply that they thought, based on this definition, they were centers of excellence. We went on to talk about, so what would the characteristics of a center of excellence be? And um, coming up at the top was providing leadership or expertise in a field or specific area, being innovative, uh, collaborative, and sharing in a deliberative way. So talking about collaborative, but not for just collaboration's sake, but for a specific purpose, and thinking about how one would, how that center would share, where, with whom, and what the, the transformative impact would be. They talked about um, two elements to um, what it means to have, to be transformative. One is to allow researchers to do more and better research. And the second is to serve future needs not yet identified by the community. So pushing the boundaries of innovation, thinking for the researchers, 
before the researchers even know what they need. Um, if you see in the last uh, line, uh, the descriptors for the characteristics are ag agile, nimble, evolves, adapts, explores. All of these have a common thread signifying evolution with openness and mechanisms to encourage or embrace change. For a center of excellence, it's not enough to enable change. A center of excellence has to seek and embrace it as the center itself evolves. And that was a, a strong common theme. So we asked them, okay, well, what would, how would you define a center of excellence? And the common definitions are, it's a center is, it's really a network rather than a center. Uh, one center decide, described it as they were a node. So it's less about the place and more about where they connect in that big network. Uh, expertise and again, mechanisms for sharing. And focused expertise delivered broadly. Um, most of the centers and funders described um, a center having a narrower um, focus of expertise, but distributing sharing broadly and producing an impact in the world. Two other themes are uh, important to mention. The centers brought up uh, certification for a center of excellence. So is there a way to validate what a center of excellence would do, similar to LEED certification? Secondly, often mentioned was, well, you would know that you could, you could know you're a center of excellence if others came to you uh, to want to work with you, to um, uh, ask you for advice, to ask you for your expertise. So that's a peer validation that you are a center of excellence. The, the next three bullets uh, came from the funders specifically. Uh, they described a center needs to be high profile. It needs a public facing personality. Um, someone who drives the center and pre prevents, I'm sorry, presents the face of expertise. That also came with a caution. If you rely on one individual and that individual leaves, that affects the stability of the center. Um, selecting experts who will shine, so people who are able to communicate, um, who are willing to go out and work with others on their, uh, what their findings are on the center, and also recruiting different expertise periodically. So refresh the team that you have. Um, that does two things. It gets new ideas into your center. It might get new ways of working. It also draws attention to your center periodically. So who you've drawn to the center and you would release that in a, in a, PR, um, in a PR message. Even changing the institution that a center partners with periodically it was a recommendation. So for us, for this part of the, uh, the interview, what we learned in the words of one of our interviewees is that excellence is a very unusual term. And now, Joy. OK, I'm going to delve a little bit more deeply into the business models that uh, we learned about. Uh, in general, I would say that with all of the uh, centers that we looked at, they were based in some kind of institutional setting, and there were partnerships with other institutions. Typically, that was because of the, the, the fun grant funding requirement, but also there was value in partnership with others uh, to solve a particular problem that perhaps no one institution could solve on their own. Uh, they also valued the institutional setting, particularly if they were faculty. Um, faculty who were also in departments could utilize their, their graduate students to help resource the center and provide research. In general, um, many of the centers had a variety of funding sources, grants being the number one, a variety of different kinds of grants. There was also university funding, state provincial funding, endowments, although not many of our centers had endowments, they all uh, wished they had. Um, memberships have a variety of different kinds of membership models that centers utilize to generate revenue. Some had partner dues. Uh, many had in-kind contributions of, of various kinds. There were others that also uh, rev were generating revenue through uh, the sale of products, knowledge products. Some had fee-based services. 
Others uh, provided training opportunities that were funded or um, had a fee-based service attached to it. Uh, many had conferences that they hosted that provided some revenue or uh, workshops. Some even went into a, a center and provided the training in-house. In general, when we looked at the overall picture of the centers, uh, most established some kind of core funding, and usually this was established with multi-year funds of some kind, an endowment, state funds. And generally that was, with our data so far at least, about one-third of the overall funding was, um, was associated with the core funding. And then the shorter term um, funding uh, was around two thirds, so two thirds soft money. Uh, and this was uh, the bulk of most of the centers we looked at were very busy with uh, grant funding and pursuing grant funds. When we spoke to the centers, we asked, one of the questions we asked is, how much time do you spend on fundraising? And all of them spend a lot of time on fundraising, so it was difficult to get an exact number, but generally 30 to 50% of their time. Some of them had a distributed model where uh, each person in the center had some obligation to do fundraising. 10 to 15 hours a week was an example of one of these. Some spent 100% of the time that one person was, was dedicated, or usually there was a team of people dedicated to some kind of fundraising in a center. What we learned, even though it seemed to be quite a burden to do fundraising and pursue grants, Almost all of them said that they valued the process of pursuing grants, that although they found it time consuming, that they felt it drove a lot of innovation. Um, and I think these two quotes are, are fairly indicative of what we heard. Um, the last one, I think it is really important to have grant funding model to keep us hungry and innovative is what we heard a lot. This idea of the competitive edge, the pursuit of, of grants to keep them innovative. And I will say that the grants, the short-term soft money grants, tended to be used for um, the innovative things they were doing, the experimental uh, projects that they were pursuing. When we asked what our centers felt were an ideal business model, uh, some of the, most of them weren't quite there. But they all said that it was very important to have a diversified funding portfolio. So that kind of parallels a little bit what Jose said about what the funders um, are looking at, at, at these centers as venture capitalism is, is what you used. Um, and that the center directors felt the same way, that, that there was a real need to have a diversified funding portfolio and, and a real requirement to have some long-term or permanent base funding of some kind. And so typically, most of them, especially the more established centers, were looking for multiple revenue streams and, and not a single source. Um, many of them valued the institutional support uh, to provide that permanent core support for, for their activity. When we asked about long-term sustainability, the answers were slightly different. So the obvious one is that um, Reliance on one-time funding is not a good idea for long-term sustainability. But more importantly, what was important for the future and sustainability is for the center to maintain a clear sense of purpose and a strong leader. So we, we've been hearing this constant theme over and over, this need for a strong leader who can really sell the vision into the future. They also spoke frequently about what the center is providing. Um, the need for the services that they provide to the community and to keep that fresh. This was pretty, uh, a really great statement that said it all in our minds. Nobody gives you money because you need it. What they want to hear is that you're doing great things, you're confident, you're optimistic, you're committed, and they support that. And again, that comes back to this notion of a strong leader that can sell the vision that can be persuasive in terms of um, pursuing grants and being successful. From the funder perspective, we also asked them what they felt was an ideal business model. Again, they said they want, first of all, they wanted to know why a center was needed. What was it meant to serve? How was, how was it going to help with the synergy in a center on a given topic? 
They too like to see a blended revenue scheme or some kind of diversified funding and not permanence on de or dependence on grants. Uh, some of them said that they'd like to see that the center was starting a business of some, of some kind and then used the profits to cross-subsidize the work. Others like to see production of knowledge products that could be sold to help with uh, supporting the center. They also wanted to see, and this parallels what Jose said earlier, they wanted to see evidence of trust, that they could trust the center, evidence of stability, and that relates to a clear governance model, clarity in the proposal, clarity in how it will be run. Uh, most wanted to see evidence of partnership or cross-institutional collaboration. And more importantly, even though the funding may have been startup funding, they wanted to be sure or see evidence that the funding was going to support capacity for the future. All of the funders said something about that this was going to help some future need. And they all said a champion, a trusted champion. They wanted to see who they could trust to give the money to. So I'll summarize some key insights so far. Uh, the concept of diversified funding, a funding portfolio was very important. Um, that funders are not interested in forever funding, that they're um, interested in startup funding and innovation, but they do want to see future capacity. Uh, grant funding model is difficult and time-consuming, but it appears to be a motivator for innovation for most of the centers. And again, coming back to the trusted champion, the personality to lead and influence. And I'll hand it over to Geneva. I'd like to um, talk about our next steps, where we're going from here. Um, so we've got a few more things to do. Uh, one of the, the big things we're looking for is some uh, feedback on our draft uh, findings once we um, put the draft report out there um, to start to get some feedback. This is the first time we're presenting our findings um, on the work that we've done. So uh, we were very excited um, to have the presentation accepted because we're looking to you um, as an audience to uh, give us your feedback on what you're hearing today. Um, let us know your thoughts, your experiences, um, so that we can um, take those into consideration as we draft the final report. Um, We've intentionally kept this presentation uh, short so that we have a lot of time to engage with you um, in discussion. Uh, we also will be sending the, the draft report to the centers and funders, the individuals there that we interviewed um, for the study. Uh, one of the things we also realized when we got together after we'd done all the interviews and you know were pouring through the transcripts is that, you know, why did we start this? We started this because of this problem that we're having with research libraries trying to meet the need for all of these new services. Um, and so then once we step back after we have all this information, we're excited about you know the findings that we have. And we sort of stopped and said, but you know what? It would probably be pretty good to get some feedback from library directors who would uh, eventually bear the burden of uh, going after these centers or supporting them or being you know, uh, full champions of them and will they embrace this model. So um, that's another uh, group that we want to get some feedback um, from. We're planning to, we're hoping to uh, do a focus session with some library directors um, since they're probably the stakeholders who are most likely impacted um, by these centers for information services. Um, and let's see if, uh, what if they would buy into the concept. So our goal is to reach, uh, to release the final report by the end of June. Um, CLEAR has agreed to post it on their website, um, so it will be available there, uh, fully open. Um, and then we'll be delivering it to uh, the Mellon Foundation and all of the individuals that were interviewed as well. So with that, I'd just like to open it up and uh, invite your comments and your thoughts.